friends, and welcome to Pod Return to the Waking Sands. We are a Final Fantasy XIV companion podcast where we explore the lore and story of Hydaelyn and beyond. My name is Jen, and I'm joined by my co-host and researcher. I'm Levi. Hello, Levi. Hello, Jen. Today, we are picking up the main story quest with Patch 2.3. We'll be playing up to the quest, Stories We Tell. Yeah. So, in the last MSQ segment, we met the Domains and we defeated Leviathan. Yes. And then we also got, right before 2.2 closed out, we got a little a little scene with Teleji at Aleji chilling in the fragrant chamber in the dark, getting a weird like update from a minion of his. And the minion is... Wondering why the fuck he was asked to do the thing he was asked to do. And Teleji and Aleji says, revolution. And then it cuts to black. And that's that. That's where we left it. Yes. So here we are. So we pick up as we do at the Rising Stones and we get our briefing from Minfilia. So she's still kind of trying to parse what could have happened with the Isle of Al. And she's she's struggling with those feelings. But nothing can be done about that. We have to wait for Uriange's report. We need to turn our attentions to something we can control, and that is some kind of fucked up etheric readings coming out of the Twelve's Wood, which were previously attributed to King Mogamog. His judgment you will dread. Correct. But after his defeat, these readings persisted. So it's something else. Probably another primal? Kind of looks primally. Yep, probably. Interrupting Minfilia, there is a knock on the door, and... I got called out for mispronouncing this name beforehand. We spent some time trying to find some Inwalker voiced scene with her in it. Could not find it. So if it's wrong, apologies. We'll be calling her Lamin. Yep. So Lamin, Minfilia's adoptive mother, knocks on the door. And she says that we have a problem. A band of refugees from Ulda are here. They want sanctuary, the same as was granted to the Domans. Minfilia says that this was probably inevitable, and she will think on what to do. Lamin cautions that we don't have resources to spare. If you take these people in, more will follow. Minfilia tersely acknowledges the point, but says that she will proceed on her own, and she invites us, the Warriors of Light, to hear out the refugees alongside her. Yeah, so we, we talked to their the... I guess they're spokesperson. And they're they're long time Jen, ref- that is a draggle tailed refugee. Draggle tailed. Yes. Jesus Christ. So they are they are long time refugees from Ulda, as they are. They're Alamegan refugees. Yeah. So they've been living off the scraps in Ulda for a long time. They were told there was work, but not for honest men. And after the calamity, the wealthy took advantage of their abundant and cheap labor with little hope of improving their lots. So Menphilia hears all of this and she's, I mean, she's like, well, kind importantly, of though, they, they came here to Revenant's Toll because word got out that the Scions had sponsored the Domains to be taken in by the people of Revenant's Toll and that they would get food, lodging, etc. in exchange for their labor. So these guys are here saying, yeah, let's work too. I- yeah. I'm here to, to work and I'll I'll get paid for it. Yeah. And get sheltered. But no. Nah. I, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's only, I mean, there's, even with the domains, shit is scarce. We're having, you know, all of the, everyone from in the Eorzean Alliance are having to like donate whatever they can. And it's just like shit's, shit's tough. And Menphilia is heartbroken by their, by their situation for sure. And she has to turn them down, which is heartbreaking for her. She's like, we simply do not have the resources. Like, we, we can't. And I'm sorry you came all this way. And, you know, it's just it's just not fucking possible. And he's, you know, he's like, oh, man, are you going to turn your back on us? And he, I mean, sure, he's devastated, of course. But just then, Tataru comes in, and she's got a very concerned look on her face. And she says that there's been some... A development in Ulda, Alfino has been wounded, and there was apparently a demonstration by the refugees that turned violent. 
And the refugee guy, bedraggled, whatever. Draggle tailed refugee. Draggle tailed. Jen. Interesting. He was like, okay, that doesn't sound correct because these demonstrations are basically peaceful. They they must have been provoked into resorting to violence. That sounds completely wrong. And now the brass blades will have all the excuses in the world to, you know, round them up and put them in jail or shoot them, whatever. Minfilia is loath to make any assumptions until we figure out what the fuck actually happened. So now it's our job to go to Ulda, find find out what happened to Elfie now, make sure he's good to go, make sure he's okay. And Minfilia will have Ida and Papa Limo take care of this Twelve Wood Ether nonsense. Fair. Yeah, that is their their job. So we head for the Ulda Adventurers Guild, the Quicksand, and we find Alfino alive and well, standing around. Yeah, he's like, news of my wounding are greatly exaggerated. That doesn't make any sense. News of my wounding has been... Anyway, yeah, anyway, I, I, I was, but not that bad. Okay, Tataru went a little overboard. So, so now he's like, you know, hey, let's give everybody a little background yeah. on why tensions are the way they are like we know he explains the whole ulda backstory pretty much yeah ulda is a nation infamous for the great disparity between the wealthy and the poor the majority of the populace accepts this state of affairs because they believe that every man bears responsibility for his own lot in life to an uldan Money is the foremost, and some would say the only measure of a man's worth. Small wonder that the wealthiest wield the greatest influence. So where do the refugees fit into this social hierarchy? What place is there for those who fled Alamigo and the destruction of the Calamity? Plainly, there is none. They have no wealth, no power, and no worth. To the Uldan way of thinking, they may as well not exist. He goes on to say that Uldans believe that one's lot is their own responsibility, and the poor are on their own to make ends meet, and if you can't, it's a personal failing. It's a meritocracy. Yes. I'll, I wouldn't go that far. <clears throat> I, I think it's a um, it's, um, wealthocracy I mean, like the- with entrenched wealth and privilege. Yeah. I mean, it, a lack of means... To a lot of people means I like maybe a lack of character. That um, that is the Uldan belief. And even those who are in poverty have kind of internalized this belief too, and they don't think that they have any right to the wealth of the city. They think that it's on them to make their own way. Not everyone, but a lot of them do. Mm-hmm. So that's the Uldan mindset. But now we have the Alamegan refugees who've come here who are not entrenched in Uldas social and wealth strata and they have nothing and so the old dons think they don't have any real real right to exist you know they, they have no wealth they have no power they are nothing and they're fed up with this position and they've got no means of claiming more because they have no means with which to actually gain any of these things yeah no one wants to give them actual like legitimate jobs you know their refugee status is is like a, a stigma and it prevents them from any sort of upward mobility. And so, yeah, they're like, why can't we just have jobs? Why can't we work? Why can't you treat us like people? So it's just, you know, same as it ever was. So General Rauban and the Sultana, they are the ones who are the biggest advocates for these refugees and the immortal flames have been providing aid to them. But this is a costly arrangement And with the aforementioned problems, there's no end in sight to this need for this aid to them. But the ongoing drain on the city's finances is turning more and more Uldans against the refugees. And the refugees are also tired of being stuck on the very bottom of starving and having nothing to do, no no say whatsoever, being entirely dependent upon the handouts of the immortal flames. So Alfino says that a violent outburst seems inevitable, and most of the flames right now are off conducting joint training with the other grand companies, so the majority of them are not here to help keep the peace. Yeah, which seemed like part of the plan. Yes, most likely yes. So 
know, despite tensions being the way they are, Alfie now, just by the nature of this particular conflict, he is convinced that something else triggered this. There was some third party, some outside influence that pushed the situation into violence. And he wants to go talk to Raban about this whole thing and figure out what maybe his thoughts are. So we find Raban at the Hall of Flames and he's like, I really don't have time for this right now, Alfino. You know. I'm like, right? <laughs> Alfino you know, walks up and he's like, may I have a word? Like, God damn it. Alfino you know, says that we are here about the reason that Raban's so busy. Pay attention, Raban. We, we can help. Alfino you know, then asks about the details of the riot. Apparently, he was more injured than he let on, as he doesn't really fully recall the event. He evidently got knocked unconscious earlier and recovered, but still, he was out for most of it. So Raban says that the riot started here in Ulda, but spread into the surrounding areas, into all the outer settlements around in Thanalan. And the immortal flames that are still here in the city, they're all busy trying to find these rioters and probably arrest or kill them. His goal right now is to restore order. So they did so, they secured Ulda very quickly, but now they've got these other pockets kind of lingering out there. They've got a Find the upstarts and just cancel it all. Cancel it all. Just, wow. They're going to cancel. Canceling riots. You see, um, that, that is his explanation. But the efforts here is that th- these people who are involved in this violent uprising, they're still out there. They're not like agitating elsewhere. They've gone to ground for the most part. And I think it's more about justice in a sense than it is about trying to restore order, as he puts it. Because we'll see in a little bit that these people have really gone to ground and they are being hunted down now by the flames who are not going to let them get away with this outburst. Right. You can't just have loudmouth revolutionaries chilling out there ready to to fuck your shit up. So he's got- we know what side Jin's on. This is- this is- Rob Bond's motivation and he says as much. He's like, I can't listen to your like theories. I have to- I have work to do. But before Alfino got knocked out or whatever happened to him, he noticed that many of the refugees were were armed with, like, martial weaponry and, you know, not pitchforks, not kitchen knives, not sticks and stones or whatever. Raban is like, okay, yeah, get to the point. And uh, Alfino goes on for, like, five paragraphs about how refugees wouldn't buy weapons or own weapons they would prefer to have food yeah that's and that's that's the inference we got he it makes the same point we got it three to five times Thank over you we <laughs> got it Robon says fine and and, get yeah, you. and then <laughs> yeah so what, are you, what are you gonna do and so something or someone must have instigated this riot and on purpose and at great expense so Robon is like okay heard you right now however my priority is restoring order until such time an investigation has to wait. And he walks off. And Alfie's like, Alfino's like, you know, I, sure, I get it. That's fine. We will do it ourselves. Alfino says that the general's demonstration is most likely for show and not his own feelings because he cannot be seen to try and speculate wildly about this shit or talk out loud about this conspiracy, which could get a lot of people killed. Yeah. Not just that, Jen, but also he and the Sultana are responsible for the refugees being where they are in a certain perspective. They they are here and they are provided with aid because of them. And if Raoban were to make any sort of baseless speculation or accusations as to there being an outside reason, then it can seem like he's trying to shirk responsibility. It's not his fault that they're in here. He's trying to blame an outside party for a problem of his making. So even though he might agree with us, and we'll find out later on that he does agree with Alfino, he's not going to say one word in public to that extent for fear of it getting to the wrong ears and creating problems for him in the Sultana. Yeah, a lot going on. Very delicate situation. Alfino now says that we will conduct our own investigation. He's like, I'm going to go do this. You go talk to Commander Swift and figure out where these settlements might be that are harboring the uh, quote-unquote belligerents. And then we can talk to those groups and hopefully get an idea of who this like weird armor of refugees is. So we're like, hey, Commander Swift, what do you know about these guys? And he's like, I don't think that's something I should be talking about, but you're you, so I, I, it's fine. He says that 
some suspicious activity has been reported around Lost Hope. So we're going to go talk to a couple of uh, brass blades at Lost Hope. Lost Hope is, I think we've been there a couple times before. Yep. They're a, a, a refugee camp kind of near and within these caves just, I think, north of Blackbrush Station. Yeah. So there's a there's a couple of blades stationed there. We talked to the first one I talked to is on Alberga. And she said that the the refugees living in Lost Hope are like we're this is it. They've we're lost f- hope. Correct. They, we, they no have more. consigned themselves to a life of of peace and quiet with literally no hope of any other life and they're not really interested in riots and social upheaval. Some people aren't able to grasp that concept. Like that merchant that came by recently, man, he talked a lot. And when he left, I was like, great, what a dick. Mm, there's, a, there's So there's a merchant. And then the Ofric, the other blade chilling there, he was like, oh, so you must have read my report. We didn't. But OK, he said a, f- a few refugees did leave with this merchant and they have not returned. And uh, he says Zazawaka's suspicions were correct. And he's like, you don't know who Zazawaka is. And we're like, no. He's like, go talk to him. He's in the tunnel. Zazawaka is, of course, a Lalafell, an Alamegan refugee wearing the one outfit they all get. It's the standard issue refugee tunic. We find him there by a tent inside these caves, and he immediately recoils from us until we explain that we're not here to torment him. He says, wait, you're not the one from the church of St. Adama Landama? And he goes on to explain that this merchant came to camp trying to persuade the refugees that it was time to take the ruling class to account. Zazawaka tried to persuade the other refugees from leaving, but some still took up this merchant's cause and left. And now, though, one of them has returned. This person is evidence of the consequences of this plan. So... We can find now this person, this terrified refugee who is cowering beside a nearby tent. He's been traumatized by his experience in the riots. We have to give him a slash soothe for him to continue. Yeah, he witnessed this whole thing, and it was quite the bloodbath, apparently. He was in the whole thing. Yeah, so to hear Alfino tell it, he doesn't really express just tell. Oh, again, he was probably knocked out, so he wouldn't know. But a lot of people died that day. The terrified refugee explains that when he went with this merchant along with his fellows, he the merchant revealed a cache of weapons. And when he saw these, he wanted to, to bail. He's like, I, it's getting too serious. I'm out. But the others in his group were ready to take arms. They were incensed. And this guy was compelled to follow the group. He also tells us that there were mercenaries, too, that were supposed to train the refugees in use of the weapons, but when the fighting started, the mercenaries were nowhere to be found. And after the main riots were dispersed, the flames tracked down the hiding place of this refugee's group, and the encounter soon turned to violence. With the majority of his group being slaughtered by the flames, this guy escaped. There's still one more group, though. They split into two at some point, and there's still one group who have gone around who have not been found, as far as we know. And he asks us to intervene to go locate them and try to talk them down before they meet a similar fate. Yeah. Like, look, the same shit is going to happen to you if you don't, like, back the fuck off. The other group of refugees is led by twins who are both fanatical in their hatred of the Uldans. And there is no way that they'll back down peacefully. But maybe, says this guy, if we can defeat them, then their followers will stand down. Right. If they can see that one person can very easily defeat them, then they would be no match for, you know, the flames or the blades or anybody else. Uh, So we find a dude hanging out from this group in a different tunnel. And we're like, hey, we want to talk. And he's like, no, we're not talking. We're just going to kill you. And a bunch of people attack us. Yeah, this plan to cut off the head does not work out. We have to beat up a good probably seven to ten refugees before they give up. Yep. It's revealed later on implicitly that they're not killed, they're just injured. We gave them a solid thrashing. Mm-hmm. But either way, though, this was not the the minimally violent solution that we had planned for. Yeah. So even with their weapons, they were no match for us. And the, the guy, like, the message has been sent. They got it. 
So we go back to our terrified refugee friend and he's like, yay, the plan worked. What did the merchant have to say? And we're like, well, the merchant wasn't there. And then terrified refugee thinks maybe he went back to Stone's Throw just outside of the Gates of Nald. Uh, A recruit- Stone's Throw from the Gates of Nald, Jen. We get it. Yes. Hence the name. Maybe he went back to Stone's Throw to recruit more people. And we need to find this guy and tell him to stop. So off we go to Stone's Throw. The first person we find is a young girl named L Ellie Eel. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's I think it's a fantasy spelling of Ellie. L frankly. maybe L or Ellie. Yeah. Well, she's crying because she misses her parents. Her parents left with the quote unquote man from Ulda and enticed them with promises of living within the walls with everyone else. And she was like, "That sounds awesome," but she hasn't seen them in days now and we ask her like well do you know where this merchant guy is and she's like no but and then she stops and looks behind us at this point the camera zooms way out and we see someone tromping around the hill way up on the slope that's him cries the girl and meanwhile the comically villainous mistrustful merchant wonders to himself out loud which of these gullible fools shall be my next victim And then he sees us looking at him, and he bolts. And the girl yells, go get him, mister. Yeah. I mean, it's not like he knows who we are, but he's just... He might. And also, we look very different from the refugees. We're definitely not one of them, and we're looking right um, at him. My bow is one and a half times the size of my body, so that's probably intimidating. We can hope. So we run off to the the Uldan dispatch yard, and he's, he's hiding there. And we fucking got him. He immediately starts gaslighting us. Like, no, no, no. Wait, what, you're just going to believe a bunch of, you know, shitty refugees? Like, come on. I, I give him literally, like, one word. I was like, Wah. I say a very, like, I say maybe one or two words, just looking at how, you know, lip reading myself. Uh-huh. Which, apparently, what I had said was essentially, oh, then come back with me to the Hall of Flames if you're so in the right here. And he's like, you know, I'm not doing that. I'm not going back to the, I'm not going there. And then we, I I do like the little like half step forward, like, uh-huh. oh, like, you want to go? Like, uh, you know, like, I don't know. But then <laughs> that was enough. He sputters some excuse about how, you know, even if he were involved, he doesn't really give a shit about politics. It's just all business, baby. During this, the camera cuts over to another nearby hill where there is a bow-carrying figure wearing robes who's watching us. We cannot make out any features. But back with a merchant, he's now prepared to sell out the mastermind behind this operation. That guy's the one that we want. And of course, an arrow flies out of nowhere right into this guy's chest. He's dead. Yep. We look for the archer and they're nowhere to be seen. We do... Yeah, we do see them, though. But then we, we like get a sense of something right before he dies. And we look towards the cliff and we can that me like the arrow's already in midair. It's too late. We do see a person, though. We look back. He's gone. You know, classic. Two stone torches that are hanging out in the dispatch yard run up. They're like, what's going on? These guys are real cute. These are two Lalafels who are wearing full metal armor. So they got their little, their little like ball head, you know. It's like the the little guy that runs around Revenant's Toll. He's like guarding the Etherite. It's that same. It's just like a little round. It's like helmet. a, a skull cap and some sort of chain jaw covering. It's like a cupie doll. Yeah, they're just like little little dudes. I'm like, you guys are too cute. So they're like, all right, spread the word. L- you know, fan out. Look for this guy. And they're like, you're good. You can go. <laughs> So we go back and we tell Commander Swift everything that just happened. And he was like, you know, despite the silencing of the merchant, we feel like we're making some pretty good headway in figuring out who this person is. He makes a big info drop here. He says, our merchant wasn't murdered. He was silenced. We got that. Thank you, Detective Swift. Yep. Yep. So... Now we, we've received a summons to the Fragrant Chamber. So 
the Sultana, Raban, and Alfino are in this room now trying to we're talking about the stuff. Talking about my situation. At the entrance, Alfino hopes that we can have an honest conversation behind closed doors. So we head in and we meet with Raban and the Sultana, who still does not know my name, judging from the culinary inquest. Yeah, she's like, why is the chef guy here? <laughs> hey, you. Yeah. Warrior light. Yeah. Raban thanks us for our investigations and has his own info to share. This knowledge is not to leave this room, even though it will. Yeah. Literally. Y- yeah. He says that the vote to reject the Doman refugees served to some as proof of a policy of discrimination. Following this, a number of protests broke out, all of them peaceful. But the incident which led to violence was when a unit of brass blades loosed arrows upon unarmed protesters. And this is what provoked the refugees to take up arms. At first, they had assumed that the incident with the blades was an accident. But on interrogation of their commanding officer, it was revealed that someone paid him to give the attack order. The payer, a merchant in the employ of Teleji Adeleji. Alfino is shocked at this revelation. He stands up out of his chair, slamming the table. Sure enough, our fears were soon confirmed. The dog confessed that a merchant had offered him coin to give the order. A merchant in the employ of Teleji Adeleji. Teleji Adeleji. But he spoke in favor of the Doman's cause, and has ever seemed sympathetic towards the refugees' plight. Why would he do such a thing? Yeah. You know, it's it's an interesting reaction. He's immediately on his feet, slams the table, and is like, Teleji Adeleji? That makes no sense. He's always been a sympathizer of the refugees' plight, and he was supportive of the Domans. Why would he do this? Yeah, you're cute. Raban asks Alfano if he's familiar with the Cartano Reclamation Bill. This is kind of a character break in a couple of ways. First off is that last time we met with Teleji, Alfino was being the cool guy in the corner saying how Teleji's apparent charity was he suffered, He was like, there's no way he's doing this altru- altruistically. Yeah. Yes. So he should not be shocked. Also, Alfino being the <laughs> shitty know-it-all he is right now, he should know about the Cardinal Reclamation Bill. He should. There's no way he, he wouldn't know about that, I feel like, given how he makes it his business to know everyone else's business, um, at least in political circles. Right. But yeah. anyway, so Raban, though, shares with us this bill. This is a bill sponsored by Teleji Adeleji. He says that ever since the destruction wrought by Bahamut unearthed elegant ruins in Cartano, the various city-states have disagreed on how to handle these ancient treasures. Raban then goes on to explain the Frontline's PvP mode. He says, in the interest of preserving peace between the nations, they have mutually agreed to a policy that no, quote, military exercises in Cartano will affect relations between nations. Fortunately for them, there's an ample supply of respawning adventurers to go beat each other up over the ruins. Nice. This honestly seems like, okay, so we're going to have some bloody battles in this no man's land and everything, anything goes here. Just going to ignore it. We're, ignor- we're going to ignore it. Yeah. We're not going to get mad about it. It's, it's a it's very, paper very, thin. Very weird. I can't imagine that there's like a lot of one-on-one like personal beefs. That I can understand, but I, I cannot, it doesn't make any sense that, like, twin adders are sitting there, like, you know, throwing thumbs at the, the maelstrom or whatever, or, like, you know, going, like, you know, hey, little, little Bodhi boys, bunch of, you want, you want these ruins? And they're like, hey, shut the fuck up, you weird hat wearing... Well, Jim, we uh, have you know, like, hundreds. It if doesn't. Not, it doesn't. That's not a thing. We got hundreds, if not thousands, of front lines matches per day, Jen, as people fight over these things. Th- this is a kind of coy way to justify the player versus player modes, and they could have left it in the corner. I feel like the more scrutiny drawn to it, the more it falls apart. We didn't need to know that each of the city states maintains a presence there, and here are the dynamics of that. We don't need to know that. We can just say like. 
Each city-state maintains a presence because elegant relics or whatever, just even like to keep other people from trying to take advantage. Because we know if somebody with nefarious motives tries to get a hold of elegant ruins, bad stuff happens. Yeah. But during this explanation, the camera shows us the Borderland Ruins PvP map, home of the much maligned secure game type. Rip secure. I don't know what you're talking about. Secure Gen was one of the Frontline's maps, which most people hated, oh. and was retired probably permanently in one of the Endwalker patches. I see. Pro tip. Okay. So this disputed territory is exactly why Teleji introduced this bill. He was, you know, like, oh, this will be refugee settlement. I will make sure that everybody's got housing and that'll be great. It'll be a new fresh start for all the refugees. This will solve all of our problems. You just let my company handle it. And clearly he's just angling to get his ass in there and get proximity to these ruins and, you know... Relbon says he stands to benefit in one conceivable way from this action. Nanamo says Omega. They think that Adelegi is looking to locate the reputed Omega weapon, which is more powerful than Ultima. Records say that this weapon was meant to kill Bahamut himself, and it is supposed to be buried in Cartineau. This may have been why Nail von Darnus opted to bring Dalamud down there, as an attempt to destroy the main threat to Bahamut. This is kind of a weird bit too. If there are runes there, and there's obviously these skirmishes over the ruins that happen daily, there's obviously wealth there. You don't, you don't need to have the speculated plan to want to get in on those ruins as a private entrepreneur. Right? Well, you know, using the refugees is an actually, that's a valid fucking reason. If he was like, can I just go in there and have like open like a mine uh, or something? Not, They'd be like, no. That's not my point though, Jin. Everyone here believes that there's one reason only that Teleji Adelegi wants to be in Cartano, and they make this assumption and go down a rabbit hole of assumptions based on, I think, a fallacy. Because there are ample reasons to want to get your hands on elegant ruins and tech in general, you know, see all the proof in the Crystal Tower and right. the Coil storyline. You don't need the big O to want to go in there. It's just elegant tech that he would now have easy access to. Already, that's bad. Right, but they don't say that. They say that he's there because Omega is there. There is crazy shit down there. You don't need this one reason to justify it. I think that the ruins themselves are justification enough to not need further explanation as to why he would want to try and corner... No, I was sold. I was like, that makes full sense. Right. But these these people, though, Alfino, Raban, and the Sultana don't see it that way. So I, I think, again, this is kind of a fallacy that they're working off of. And they conclude that there's only one reason, and they make a bunch of assumptions based on that one assumption, which I think is just kind of a flawed line of reasoning. And they don't outright say it here, but they imply that Omega has already been found at this point. They mention that it's been partially excavated, and also Nanamo says that at present, it's more akin to a fossil. But still, if it were restored, it could put Teleji Adeleji on the path to world domination. He who has always been two steps behind Lord Lodorito. So this is the bit, Jen, where I'm like, okay, so they conclude the only reason why he wants to be in the ruins is to get Omega, and that he wants Omega to achieve world domination. And this is all predicated on one of, of what I would argue to be many reasons why he'd want to be up in those ruins. The overall motivation is not disputed. He wants to sponsor these refugee settlements here so he can have easy access to the ruins, sure. But I think that saying that it's all about Omega is a huge stretch of reasoning. I guess. And how how does he know about it? You know? Well, we'll find out in a minute. As right when Raban is saying this information about Omega, there is a thump by the chamber entrance, like a door has been slammed shut. Raban makes to pursue this interloper, but Nanamo says to not bother. Only a fool would believe that secrets can be kept in Ulda. Yep, well, there that goes. Whatever. So that that's how he would know. No, 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 no. Like, he knew before this. Like, right, that but... was the, 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 when, when the reclamation bill was proposed, it's assumed that he knew about Omega and that's why he wanted to get in there. Correct, but... Like, how many fucking months or years ago was that? The the implication here that Nanamo just gave is that there are rats everywhere. 
there's no yeah. no trying to keep things secret. So last time they met about Omega in in supposed secret, someone else had was creeping in this room and ran out or something like that. All right, so everybody knows. <laughs> that is pretty much literally what she says. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, the fact that Alfino didn't know, I don't know. Is he is he getting lazy? He's too honest to <laughs> use spies. That is definitely not true, actually. <laughs> not true. So that well, that basically ends the meeting. We're outside of the uh, the chamber now, and Alfino asks us to keep abreast of any developments in the Cartano Flats. Right then, there is a commotion between a, one of the Sultan Sworn and the young girl, Ellie, from Stone's Throw. She followed us all the way up here. To She was like, I'm looking for you. And have we found the man yet? And if we have found the man, have we found her parents? And we're like, well, yes, but no. Alfina, however, is like a really, like a total bro in this moment. He's like, hey, I will help you look for your parents. But right now I have to, I'm telling a secret to my friend over here. And you know how secrets are, right? So if you could just, like he talks to her like, I don't know. I thought it was really quite sensitive and appropriate the way he spoke to her. And so he turns back to us and he says, I think I'll take her to the quicksand and Mamodi will probably be able to help her. But he's just kind of displeased at this whole mess. He's like, I, I, I'd rather deal with an Asian than this this bullshit here. This Adelegi, Cardano, Allegan, conspiracy, refugee, fucking quagmire that this is. So, and then he also kind of starts talking about like maybe Minfilia is a little overwhelmed and the Scions in general are overwhelmed. We're being sent hither and thither across the realm all the time for all sorts of things that pop up. And he's like, we're we're tired. Maybe it's time for a change. Put a pin in that. And then speak of the devil, Minfilia calls us on the Link Pearl and she says that the situation in Twelve's Wood has escalated. It's taken turn for the worse. And we need to return to Revenant's Toll ASAP. And Alfino is like, I haven't heard anything about Ixali bullshit. So this probably means that the Sylphs are responsible. Oh, he says. And by the way, tell the antecedent that she needn't fear for his well-being. He's quite capable of looking after himself. Tell the antecedent that she needecedent worry about my go on stuff <laughs> killed it and that's the end for now how's it going Jen? did you not agree with my irritation at the omega he does, like I said, he doesn't need Omega for it to be a tantalizing prospect for him. Yeah, that's my but point too. Also, if he were given the contract or the lease of the land to to you know do refugee settlement shit in Cartano Flats, do you think any of the city states, anybody in the alliance, would allow him to touch those fucking relics? Don't you think Rambrose or etc. or some other organizations, the Scions, somebody affiliated, would have them camping out and be like, you you can't touch this shit. This is like a scientific. This is a research site. This is not for you. Deal with your refugee shit. Like, you know, they're not just going to let him Rambrose, mine the whole place. Rambrose isn't active in Cartano. No, that's no, no. A, no. A I'm saying like the Sons of St. Coinock or some other similar organization, a scientific backed organization would be stationed there. You know, it's, it's an, archa they, they an archaeological site. They literally are not. Site. I know you don't do front lines, Jen, but <clears> in <throat> those games, you are literally defending these elegant ruins while you excavate them or download data for them or whatever. Like you are pillaging those ruins nonstop in front lines. I, I hate to invoke PvP as story, but also the game did it just now. So it's kind of demands it. But That's weird. Th there's no neutral party involved here. You are fighting bloody battles over these elegant data nodes and you're trying to download the most data from them for your grand company. It's not a good look. It is not a good look. I agree. They could have left the story off of PvP. Crystalline conflict's better. That's just for fun. That that yeah. feels much better. Frontlines is kind of a weird fossil in a sense, in terms of the fact it kind of exists in canon, even though it doesn't also, especially like in this day and age. Yeah, there's there's no way like I, I have to separate it from the story. I, just, I have to. I, I agree. It should stay there, but they invoked it also. Frankly. Yes. I mean, like I can I can turn my brain off for this shit. This is this is more like war games, right? This is not actually the immortal flames 
trying to like dig up Allegan ruins so that they can make Ulda stronger with this Allegan tech that they uncover. And meanwhile, the Maelstrom and the Twin Adder are like trying to get them to stop. They're like fighting them. Like, you can't dig this shit up. Rah, stop it. Shoot, 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 shoot. And then like, now it's our thing. Like, I can't imagine that that is actually happening. I mean, I have to turn I, my brain off to it. That's that would be fair in general. And I would encourage that. But but also in PvP and I have done it. OK, the, it is it is kind of sold as more like war games as opposed to we're killing bitches. Again, I, I hate to do this, Jen, and I agree that should stay in the corner, but also they invoked front lines directly in this cutscene. So we are forced now to acknowledge that at least at this point in the story, this is really happening because they have shown us the battlegrounds. They have talked about this conflict, these quote, military exercises in this contested territory. And, you know, it's, it's all now like in play story wise here. So, there are no sense of St. Koinok. They might want to be there, but they're not being allowed there. And frankly, I don't think they have the political capital to force out these armed nations. No, I'm for saying their... nobody's forcing anybody out. I'm saying like you can do your shit here, but this is this is science now. OK, Jay. they don't get to do that because they don't have any political capital to force out these armed forces for their science shit. They can ask nicely, but. They are not active. No, in no, no. Them. They would not be asking. It would be the alliance that would be like, okay, it is out of our hands. It should be out of our hands. I'm saying this is the way it should be. Oh, yes. I agree with that. No question there. That's all. Yeah. But as it is now, though, we have this disputed area. And I think they say actually in the fragrant chamber cut scene that Teleji's actions would upset the balance and would probably draw retribution from the other nations if Ulda were to annex part of the Cartano Flats. So Teleji's gambit here, if he can force it through based on this refugee panic that he's trying to incite, then he also creates problems for the other nations and their relationship to Ulda by saying that Ulda claims ownership over this part of Cardinal, which would be a breach of this semi-truce that's in play right now. Yeah, he's he's stirring up some major shit. He or wants to. Yeah. Yep. yeah. I, I think that someone in the Discord said recently apologies i can't recall their name but in talking about the the crystal tower series and how the characters there were kind of forced into it without much plausibility it kind of feels the same way here too where the writers wanted omega weapon to be on the table so it's all about omega now they're saying because we say so teleji is after omega and he's trying to go for world domination and I think we're just expected to believe that because they said it. As we know, the the writing kind of got a an overhaul as we approach Heaven's Ward from events that happened in this Realm Reborn post game, and that includes this whole Omega thread as well. Which I feel like at one point, at this point actually, when they're on their kind of Game of Thrones kick that they're kind of getting into now, they wanted this international strife to be the main deal both internal and also between the city-states. Well, yeah, because the alliance right now is still very new. Uh -huh. So it's 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 ripe for yep. upheaval, potentially. It's real easy to, to poke that shit because nothing is settled. I mean, I would love to get some insight into like the behind-the-scenes conversations here because they are pushing very hard in a direction that gets pulled up from hard as well. Yeah, I mean, I get it. It's like it's it's new and it's fresh and it's it's really good fodder for this kind of drama. I mean, I think it's interesting. I, there's nothing that I objecting to about this political strife, these backroom politics, and also even about okay, so we're going to have a contest over the possession of Omega. That could all be good. The writing could be improved a bit leading up to it, sure. But nothing about that is objectionable to me personally and would actually be interesting with the right approach. This could be a very fertile ground for plot development, too, in this direction. For sure. Yeah. I don't think I have anything really more to say about it. Great. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think also here in general, the game's getting more to its stride for the post Realm Reborn business, for the patch business. Mm -hmm. It was very messy at the very start where we had way too much going on and everything was, you know, hit it for two seconds and bounce off to the next distraction and so on. And we're all over the place. 
a lot more, I guess, focused than like patch 2.1, for instance, which I'm enjoying. Yeah, we had weird Asian gobbledygook and then the Doman, so it felt like, hey, what are we doing? Oh, there, there was Lamin and the Revenant's Toll move, Primal Business. There was a lot of cleanup. Yeah, a lot of cleanup. So now we get back to, uh, you know, subterfuge and yeah. uh, conspiracy. So good. It's good overall. Primals, yes. I mean, it's At aside left. from the rough bits, overall, this is a, a good piece of content Not, that I'm enjoying. N- nothing against the Domans, but I'm just glad we've moved on. I don't need to babysit more Doman kids who be like, what's it like being an adventurer? Can I be an adventurer like you? Here's my dad and my grandpa. And we've been on a boat for a long time. Okay, bye. <laughs> All right, Jen, uh, we moving on? Yep. Okay. Next time, we are playing up to the quest, What Little Gods Are Made Of. And that will do it for today's episode. Thank you all so much for listening and being super sweet. If you want to get in touch with us, you can at podreturnffxiv at gmail.com or check the show notes for our Discord. You can join up if you want to join any of our group runs. That's how you would do it. Talk about your character, your glams, what you enjoy most about the game, like fucking whatever. It's just a really, really good group of people. So come on in. And we also have our Patreon, patreon.com slash podreturn, F-F-X-A-V. And for a buck a month, you have access to some bonus content that we release semi-regularly. We have all of the seasonal events in the game we talk about there. And we also have the Final Fantasy XI series, the Vanadiel Vance Planer. This is all about, like, this is front-loading for Dawn Trail. So if you want to learn a little bit more background info on that, check it out. And with that... We hope you enjoyed the episode. Have a good day or night, and we will see you next time.